right guys, so now we're going to go ahead and look at chapter 14. Chapter 14 focuses on the brain and the cranial nerves, and we'll do this um, chapter in two parts because it's kind of long. So when we're looking at chapter 14, um, we're talking about the human brain. Um, the human brain is composed of about three pounds of tissue, so your brain weighs about three pounds. It's also the size of about what your two fists put together like this. This would be about the size of your brain. It is the center for registering sensations, making decisions, and taking actions. So not only do you are you able to kind of be aware of what's around you through the sensation side, it also allows you to have movement um, reaction type side. It's also the center of your intelligence, your emotions, your behavior, and your memory. It is composed of about 100 million neurons. Um, if you'll recall back in chapter 12, um, in Anatomy 1, we talked about the structure of the neuron. The neuron kind of looks like your hand where you have the cell body, the dendrites, and the axon. Okay, there's about 100 billion of these in your brain. However, um, they cannot do their job without the help of the neuroglial cells. Remember, neuroglial cells are things like oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, microglia, those types of cells. And there's about 10 trillion of them. So they have to take care of the neurons and keep them healthy and nurse them and that sort of thing. And so that way they can do their job, which is the connecting and sending the impulses and letting us sense things, but also with um, taking actions. Um, the larger the size of the brain, the higher the seat of intelligence is. Um, we see this in when we look at animals going from something simple like a jellyfish where they just have a nerve net where there's not really a brain up into us where you can see the brain here in this picture. The, the larger the brain, especially the larger the cerebrum, which is the top part of the brain, the higher a level of intelligence the organism has. So let's take a little quick look. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on brain development and how the brain develops um, early on in the embryo, um, but it does develop during the first 26 days. Within those first 26 days, which is about the first month, we actually start seeing the brain forming and it starts to, sh to resemble structures that we will be talking about throughout this um, chapter. So when we look at this, this is table 14.1. Um, it's located on page 474 in your book. Um, you can see that it starts out as more simple brain where it has the primary brain vesicles where it has the three parts this is at three to four weeks um, after conception after the um, zygote is formed the egg fertil is fertilized by the sperm but you'll see within the fifth week especially between four week four and five it starts to divide where we can see that you have the right and left sides of the brain and we're going to see each of these structures that we're going to be talking about um, throughout the chapter now, one thing to note, too, as we're looking at the structure of the brain is that the brain and the spinal cord form from the ectodermal neural uh, tube. Now, ectodermal means it's the outer layer of our tissue. Um, we start out as three layers of tissue. You have the ectoderm, which is the outside, the mesoderm, which is the middle, and the endoderm, which is the innermost part. Okay, so when we're looking at those three le le uh, layers, the ectodermal part's the outer part, and this is going to be your skin, your nerves, that sort of thing, and this is the neural tube. Now, if this neural tube does not form correctly, we are going to see some issues with the neural tube defects, which I have on the next slide. When we look at neural tube defects, it depends on which side of the neural tube is not actually formed properly. If it is the inferior portion, the bottom portion of the spinal cord, this is called spina bifida. Um, when we look at spina bifida, it can be um, very minor in the sense that you may not even know that you have spina bifida where there's the small separation in your uh, vertebral column, but your spinal cord is not protruding out of that separation. But it could be as severe as you see here in this picture where the spinal cord is protruding out of that separation into a um, sac that's just a membrane with skin around it. And this can be very dangerous because if this ruptures and the spinal cord is damaged, of course, then this child will experience issues below that portion in their body. And so um, this is what we look at for spina bifida. On the other hand, if it's the superior and the top end of the neural tube that doesn't form properly, we call this anencephaly. And this is seen in the picture here where the top part of the brain does not form correctly and even the cranial case does not form around that brain. Okay, and so when we look at this, this causes an issue on the superior side. Now, spina bifida is not necessarily life-threatening. It could be, especially during childbirth, if they try to have normal childbirth. Um, a lot of times, C-sections are performed. Um, surgeries can be done to help this side of it. And encephaly, there's not a whole lot that can be done to help correct this or fix this problem.
Now, um, when we look at the brain, the brain is organized into some major parts. There are four major parts or components we want to focus in on. The first one is the brain stem. This is a continuation of your spinal cord. It, it is segmented into three parts, the medulla oblongata, which attaches to the spinal cord, then the pons, and then the midbrain. So it has three sections to it for the brain stem. We then see the uh, cerebellum. This is the second largest component of the brain. Um, this area is going to help coordinate your movements, and this is a subconscious coordination. So when we look at you, like when you go to walk across the room or ride a bike or something like that, you don't have to think about every type of movement with your balance or your posture. This area does that subconsciously. So it contributes to your muscle tone, your posture, and your balance. The diencephalon is the next region. This gives rise to the thalamus, hypothalamus, and another one that's not listed here is the epithalamus. Now guys, the epithalamus is, consists of the penile gland, which is part of the endocrine system talked about in chapter 18. The cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain. It's the newest when we look at the evolutionary scale of the brain. Um, as a whole, this um, is made of the cerebral cortex. This is where your perception takes place, your thought, your imagination, your judgment, your decision making. All of those higher seat intelligent um, functions occur here in the um, cerebrum. All right, so we have some diagrams here. Um, these diagrams are found on page 475 in your book. So if we take a look here, you can see the brain stem is highlighted here. Um, it's the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. We also see then you have the cerebellum. It's the second largest part. You have the diencephalon, which is made of the hypothalamus, thalamus, and epithalamus, also known as the penile gland. And then you have the cerebrum, which is the largest portion of the brain. All right, so this is your brain organization. Before we continue talking about what each of these sections do specifically, I want to talk a little bit about how do we protect this brain, okay? Because the brain needs some extra protection um, because the nervous tissue is so delicate. Now, of course, it's going to be covered with the um, cranial bones. So when we look at this, it creates that cranial cavity, which is where your brain is going to be located. And we talked more about these bones when we did bones back in anatomy one. What I want to talk about now, though, is I want to talk about the other things that protect the brain besides just the bony out covering. We have the what we call the cran cranial meninges. These meninges are continuous with the spinal meninges, which were covered at the very end of anatomy one. Um, it, they have three layers to them. They have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So if you look at the dura mater, it's shown kind of in this greenish color. It's called the tough outer layer because dura mater actually means tough mother. Okay, if you when you do the brain dissection, if your brain came with a um, actual uh, the meninges attached, you can actually pull that dura mater and it's really tough. It's hard to tear it. It's a really tough structure. Now the arachnoid mater is right underneath that dura mater and it's more of a spidery type structure. Um, when we look at this, it kind of looks like a spider web. Um, this area is going to have little holes and crevices that are going to be filled with a fluid that we'll talk about later. Um, the last layer is a very thin and delicate layer and this is the one that's right up against the brain tissue itself and it's called the PM mater. Now, one thing to note though about the dura mater, that really tough layer, it or that really tough outer covering, it is made of two layers. Um, it has an external layer, which is called the paraosteal layer. This is the, the part that's right up against the bone. And then it has an internal, what we call um, meningeal layer. This is the one that's closer to the brain. Now, when we look at these two layers, they actually will form thicker regions in certain areas um, that actually help create compartments within the brain. Um, these more um, strict regions are going to form hard non-compliant membranes, and they are going to keep the brain in certain compartments. Um, and one way to look at it is kind of like the, the um, cerebrum at the top. It has a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere, and they're kind of put together here. They are going to be um, separated here in the middle, and one of these structures that's going to help separate them is made out of these extensions of the dura mater. So it helps keep the brain in its certain places. Now, this is not 100%. Sometimes these can get damaged, especially during injury. We can see that the brain can herniate or move into another area through these membranes, which can cause major problems. It can start putting pressure. This could be due to a brain bleed. It could be due to an injury um, where there's swelling in the brain, things like that that can cause issues. Now, 
there are three of these non-compliant type extensions that we want to kind of um, look at here. The first one's called the Fox uh, Cerebri. This one is a strong sickle shaped. Okay, sickle shaped when we look at it, like a sickle that they used to use for um, harvesting and stuff like that before we had all those machines. Also, sickle shape is like kind of like a half moon. So when we look at that sickle shape, it separates the two cerebral hemispheres, so the right side from the left side. You also have the Fox uh, Cerebelli. This is the small triangular portion. That's Going to separate the right and left side of the cerebellum okay so it has a right and left side as well um, how do we separate the cerebellum from this uh, the cerebrum that's the tentorium cerebelli this separates these two so it keeps these different parts of the brain in their own compartment for the most part as long as there's no damage to them now the next thing I want to talk to you about is called the blood brain barrier but before we get there we have to talk about how blood actually gets to your brain how do we get the blood to your brain now the brain represents only about 2% of your total body weight because it only um, is about three pounds of tissue however one thing to note though even though it's only three pounds of tissue it receives about 20% of your blood supply at any given time so it's receiving a lot of blood and with that blood it's delivering a lot of oxygen and glucose to the brain okay because your brain cells are actively working whether you're asleep or awake and so because of that we're going to see that it's going to need a constant supply of oxygen and glucose there's no way for the brain tissue the neurons to store the glucose so they have to have the constant supply now blood flow to the brain happens through the internal carotids okay those are found here the carotids are here they run through your neck and these are for the vertebral and the vertebral arteries if you'll recall back when when you looked at the spine, the cervical vertebrae had those transverse foramen on the sides, the holes. And you can see them here in the picture where those blood vessels travel up to the brain. You'll also see that when they enter into that skull cavity through those other foramen or holes, they spread out to be able to service these areas with the blood supply. Now, how does the blood then get collected and sent back out? Well, the blood's going to get collected in the dural venous sinuses. These are going to ultimately drain into the internal jugulars, which are also going to be located in the and they are going to then ultimately drain that blood back to the heart through the superior vena cava. So when we look at this, this is kind of just basically showing you how we get blood to the brain and how we get blood out of the brain. Now the big thing with this though too is that this blood supply is super important. Since it ha takes about 20% of our blood, um, it means the brain needs this constant supply. So if the blood is not getting to the brain properly, we can see that within a minute or two um, of not getting enough oxygen oxygen and glucose up to the brain, we can actually see problems that happen. Um, things like improper functionings where the person won't make sense, they might be um, hallucinating, passing out, things like that. Um, within four minutes where there's no oxygen or limited oxygen and glucose getting to the brain within four minutes, there's permanent damage okay, that we cannot reverse. Now the brain may be able to re re uh, reroute around the damage, but that area of the brain will be damaged and cannot um, uh, be saved. All right, so this is why it's really important that when somebody goes down, down, the first thing you do is to check their breathing um, then you also check their circulation because not only do they need breathing to get oxygen in we need to be circulating that blood so it gets to their brain now one thing to note is this blood does not come in direct contact with the brain tissue this is called the blood ba brain barrier or the BBB um, this barrier is formed um, when the vascular endothelium around the brain capillaries form what we call tight junctions. Um, if you'll recall way back from chapter four with tissues, tight junctions are where they've been like sewn together really tight where they're water sealed. This is to allow um, no leaking of fluid into the brain tissue. So this way that they can be very selective about what gets to come into the brain and leave the brain. Um, now when we look at this, um, it's going to help keep a lot of harmful substances out, especially like bacteria. Bacteria won't be able to gain as much access into your brain um, when you have different kinds of infections, and that's a good thing. We don't want them to get into that brain tissue. Um, oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as water, they get to move pretty freely through this barrier only because they're small and they're also going to diffuse very easily. Also, lipid-soluble substances um, that like fats can dissolve across this pretty easily, and these are a lot of your hormones. Okay, so that's a good thing because a lot of the hormones that are produced by the pituitary gland that will that's talked about in chapter 18, they need to leave this brain area and go to other parts of the body and they're able to do that by entering the blood very easily because of their lipid component.
Now, water-soluble substances, the ones that are traveling through the water and the plasma of the blood, they're going to have a harder time crossing these membranes. Um, an example of this is a lot of the types of drugs that we take, um, whether it be over-the-counter, things like that, they have a harder time um, passing through here, which is a good thing because you don't want your blood pressure medication necessarily going here because that's going to be affecting other parts of your body, not your brain, um, or your um, insulin, things like that, that... Um, you may take if you're diabetic, that sort of thing when we're looking at this. Um, however, this also does stop glucose from being able to gain access easily, and your brain does need this glucose. So your brain cells, especially the astrocytes, um, they're going to be doing active transport of glucose into this uh, brain tissue. And the reason they do this is to make sure that there's enough energy. You may have heard the saying, like, it takes money to make money. Well, in this case, it takes energy to make energy. We've got to actually utilize and actively transport the glucose in so that that more energy can be made. Molecules needed to meet metabolic needs like the glucose and other proteins are going to have to be actively transported. Um, if a brain infection, though, is present, let's just say something does get into the brain um, tissue and it, it causes an infection, it's going to be pretty hard to treat because most of the antibiotics that we use um, and other therapeutic type um, drugs, in order to get it to the level where they can cross this barrier, they can actually be toxic to the individual as well. So this is why a lot of times if it's a brain infection, it's very difficult to treat. Okay. Okay, because of the medications that we have available of crossing this blood-brain barrier. So as long as it's working properly, it's keeping the bad stuff out and letting the good stuff in, it's great. However, again, nothing works 100% of the time, and sometimes we see that it get this blood-brain barrier can get compromised and something can get in that shouldn't, like a bacteria or a virus. All right, so the last thing that's a protective uh, measure for the brain is the cerebral spinal fluid. This is a clear fluid and it circulates through the brain ventricles. The brain ventricles are little holes in the brain where um, it's gonna have fluid collecting. And spinal cord central canal, if you'll recall back from the end of um, anatomy one, you'll know that the spinal cord had that central canal that ran down the middle that's gonna have cerebral spinal fluid in it as well. Now with the ventricles, guys, um, in the brain, there are lateral ventricles. This is actually ventricle one and two because they're lateral, they're on each side. Then there's a third ventricle and then a fourth ventricle. And we'll talk a little bit more about these when we get to the structure of the brain. Now this cerebral spinal fluid is gonna flow over and around the brain and the spinal cord into that subarachnoid space. We talked about that, that arachnoid area of the meninges is spider-like, it has spider web, and there's spaces. Those spaces are going to be filled with the cerebral spinal fluid. So your brain's actually kind of floating in your head so that when you turn your head from side to side or you go for a run, or if you have that whiplash in an accident or something like that, the brain is actually floating in the fluid so it's not going to be hitting your skull as hard as it could if that fluid was not present. Okay, so it's going to act as kind of like a shock absorber. And so this brings us to the three basic functions of the cerebral spinal fluid. The first is the mechanical protection, which is the fact that it's a shock absorbing medium because of the, of the fluid. The second is it has homeostatic function. Remember we talked about that blood brain barrier and we've got to bring the glucose in, the proteins in, that's when they get actively transport them. This cerebral spinal fluid is one way to get those things into the brain tissue. It also is going to help register the pH um, of the brain and keep it constant and it serves as that transport system for many of our hormones that are part of that hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Um, it's also part of circulation. This medium um, has the ability to allow for exchange of nutrients and waste between the blood and the nervous tissue um, because a lot of those nutrients like oxygen, water, things like that can come through here in the cerebral spinal fluid and then they collect the carbon dioxide and the waste and return it back to the blood later. And so this is going to be kind of that exchange medium between the blood and the nervous tissue. Now, when we look at the cerebral spinal fluid, one thing to note is how it is produced and how it circulates and flows through the brain. Um, cerebral spinal fluid is produced um, within the brain and you make about 80 to 150 milliliters um, a day as an adult. All right, so you can make quite a bit of the cerebral spinal fluid each day. Now, they, it is formed in the area called the coracoid plexus. This is a network of blood vessel capillaries that line the ventricles. Now, you'll see here that the ventricles are located here. You can see this one almost looks kind of like a butterfly shape. This is going to be those lateral ventricles where there's uh, ventricle one and ventricle 
example two. In these areas, you're going to see, like the picture shows here, this area of where it's coracoid plexus, which comes with um, epidemial cells. These cells are going to leak out fluid, and that fluid is mostly the plasma that's from the blood. Now, this fluid, once it leaves the blood vessels, no longer is called plasma. When it enters into the brain tissue, it's called cerebral spinal fluid. Well, we make 80 to 150 milliliters a day, and this is a closed case. There's only so much room in your in your brain area. So if we're gonna make this, we also have to get rid of the old cerebral spinal fluid. And so we have to see that it flows um, through a system. So let's look at kind of how it flows through the system into the subarachnoid space, which we abbreviate here as SAS. We see that it's going to first form in those lateral ventricles. As those ventricles fill up, okay, they're going to fill up, and then we're going to see that they spill over into another area, okay, kind of like when you fill the bathtub up and then it spills over out of the side because eventually it runs out of room. The same thing's going to happen here. Once those ventricles are full, we're going to see that it's going to let this fluid travel through what we call the intraventricular foramen, that's a hole, and to the third ventricle. Now. One thing that helps with this is that the lateral ventricle is at the top, so once it fills up, it's going to go through the hole and go to the third ventricle. The third ventricle is then going to fill up, and then it's going to go through what we call the cerebral aqueducts. The aqueducts allow for the movement of water in other directions. This is going to fill the fourth ventricle, which is closer to your brain stem. Once the fourth ventricle is full, we're going to see that it leaves through what we call the median apertures. Okay, the median's the middle where it's going to go to the spinal cord and also the lateral apertures where it's going to go to the side. This is going to allow it then to fill from the bottom up the subarachnoid space to where the whole brain is covered okay, and floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you take a look at these pictures, these are found on page 480 and 481 in your book. You'll see how the um, cerebral spinal fluid flows. You can follow the arrows here in the picture, as well as seeing how each one of these ventricles contributes to the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, every ventricle has those coracoid plexuses in them, so it's not just the lateral ventricle's job to make cerebral spinal fluid. The third ventricle can and the fourth ventricle can as well. You'll just notice that the third and fourth ventricles are a lot smaller than the lateral ventricles that you can see here in the picture. However, they all contribute contribute cerebral spinal fluid, which then ultimately is going to go into the subarachnoid space. However, after it's gone through the subarachnoid space, it is going to be reabsorbed, and it's going to be reabsorbed by what we call these arachnoid villi. The arachnoid villi is going to return this fluid back into the blood vessels, and it'll be recycled by the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, that sort of thing, so that when the arterial blood comes back, it's cleaner blood to come and make this cerebral spinal fluid again. So one thing that's super important is that the pressure remain co constant in your in your head and your brain. Um, if we increase the pressure, it can put pressure on this delicate tissue and it can cause some major issues. So the rate of production should equal the rate of reabsorption. So if we're making 80 mLs a day, we should re be reabsorbing about 80 mLs um, a day as well. And so when we look at this, it does closely match. You actually absorb about 20 mLs per hour um, to kind of keep that um, pressure constant or um, consistent. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid is gradually reabsorbed back by the arachnoid villa, which you can notice are found in these kind of sinus areas. Um, and one is located up here at the very top in the sagittal sinus. What the arachnoid villa are is when they cluster together and they're there to reabsorb, they're called the arachnoid granulation and their larger areas to reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid and return it to the blood, okay, so that it then can be recycled. So the venous return so that it can leave the brain case and be recycled at the heart and lungs, taking the waste away from the brain tissue as well. Failure of the cerebral spinal fluid to form or drain normally can result in a buildup, and this buildup creates major pressure on the brain. This is called hydrocephalus. Um, hydrocephalus occurs with a lot of congenital abnormalities like premature birth, things like that. Um, it can happen through head injuries if you've got a buildup that happens due to damage in of the brain itself. Meningitis, this is where the meninges themselves get inflamed, um, and they go through inflammation, which could cause the reabsorption 
at those arachnoid villi um, to not occur. Um, also, if there's a bleeding of the brain. Now, this picture shows you a child who has an issue with hydrocephalus. Now, one thing about them, though, when we look at babies, is they have those soft spots, those fontanelles, where they don't have their brain case completely fused yet. And so because of that, it can allow expansion. If this is caught early enough, we can actually put a shunt in that can help drain this, and there's no permanent damage to the child's brain. But as, as an adult, if I was to have a brain injury and have hydrocephalus, my skull will not allow for this to happen. And so brain damage can happen a lot quicker in an adult because the brain case does not allow for expansion due to the lack of fontanelles. So now what I want to do is we want to go through each of the structures of the brain and we're going to start with the brain stem. The brain stem is just superior but it is also continuous with the spinal cord so you'll notice the spinal cord is located here. Um, it is made of three parts. We first have the medulla oblongata which is shown here kind of in yellow. You then have the pons and then you have the midbrain. So these are the three main parts of the brain stem. So let's talk about the medulla oblongata first. So when we look at the medulla oblongata, we also call this the medulla a lot of times. And you may have heard a little bit about medulla oblongata if you've ever watched The Water Boy. The big thing with this is that the medulla is made of mostly white matter. If you'll recall back from the nervous system chapters in anatomy one, you have white matter and gray matter, which is found in the brain. The white matter, guys, is the myelinated axons of the cells. Okay, so if we're looking at a neuron here, these are the dendrites, the cell body and the axons on this part would be the white matter whereas the cell body and the dendrites they're not myelinated so they're called the gray matter okay so that's the difference when we say this the medulla is composed mostly of white matter which is the axons okay now the medulla contains both motor which is the descending tract sending information down the spinal cord to allow muscles to move glands to secrete things but it also is going to have ascending tracts coming up which are sending sensory information from the rest of your body to the, your brain All right so this area is going to have those axons there that are relaying information up and down from the brain to the spinal cord on the anterior side of the medulla it's a front side you're going to notice that there's two bulges that are present these are called the pyramids um, and you can see them here in the picture the pyramids contain large motor tracts from the cerebrum to the spinal cord uh, most axons here will actually do a crossing over so this is why um, when we see individuals who have a stroke on the right side or the right side of their brain the left side of their body is affected and vice versa because there's a crossing over that happens here when information leaves this part of the brain it crosses over here in the medulla and talks to the, the left side of the body whereas this left side of the brain there's going to be a crossing over in the medulla and it's going to talk to the right side of the body so this is going to be where there's some crossing over and we call this the desiccation the crossing over within these pyramids now in the medulla there's also going to be scattered inside um, some gray matter okay we also have to have some nuclei here the nuclei here that are found in the medulla are going to be reflex centers Okay, you learned about reflexes again back in anatomy one where reflexes are going to happen at the, kind of mostly at the spinal cord level. Well, the medulla is the first extension up from the spinal cord, so we are going to see some reflex centers here. These reflex centers, though, are vital. Okay, they aren't necessarily, they're not like a knee jerk that we see um, when they hit your uh, patella tendon and your foot kicks out. These are vital reflex centers. And one example is the cardiovascular center. This is going to regulate the rate and force of each of your heartbeats, as well as the diameter of your blood vessels, so whether they're dilated or they're constricted. We also see in this area there's a medullary rhythmicity area, which is going to be your basic rhythm of breathing. Your normal in and out breathing is controlled in this area as well. So these are why these are called vital centers. You cannot survive without them. This is why individuals who sometimes have brainstem injuries, if this is the area where the injury occurs, death can happen very quickly because these centers are vital to your survival. Now, some non-vital reflexes that are also located here are swallowing, sneezing, coughing, hiccuping, and vomiting. They are also controlled here in the medulla oblongata. Now, the medulla also contains an oval nucleus area called the olive. This is involved in fine motor control, like riding, like your fine motor, tying your shoe, things like that, as well as equilibrium and posture, which means that this area is going to talk to the cerebellum, um, that part of your brain. 
The fourth ventricle is also located here, that opening that has the um, coracoid plexus, which allows for formation of cerebral spinal fluid. And this um, ventricle is going to be between the medulla and the cerebellum. Now, the medulla also contains um, nuclei of origin of five pairs of cranial nerves. So when we look at five pairs, pair means two, so five times two is ten. There's ten cranial nerves that come off of the medulla type area because um, you have one coming off of each side, okay, so when we're looking at this. Um, you can also see the handout that's given out, and we will talk more specifically about these cranial nerves um, in part two of this uh, lecture. Now. The five that are coming off here in this area are the are number eight, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve. This is for hearing and, bal and equilibrium or balance. We have number nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is going to help with swallowing, salivation, taste, and also blood pressure. We then have 10, which is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is known as the wanderer because it moves down into the chest cavity and talks to your thoracic and abdominal viscera, which are their organs. Um, number 11 is the accessory nerve. This is going to help with movement of your head and your shoulders as well as helping you with swallowing. And then number 12 is the hypoglossal nerves, which is going to help you with your tongue movement, which is going to be important for speech but also swallowing. All right, so moving on to the next structure of the brainstem, this is the pons. This is superior to the medulla, so it's just above the medulla. The pons is actually known as the bridge, which connects the spinal cord with the brain. So this is the brain region um, is actually going to come together with the spinal cord. Um, this is known as what we call a peduncle or a stem-like connecting part. Okay, it's connecting, and this is why it's known as the brainstem, it's connecting the spinal cord to the brain. Um, this is going to relay nerve impulses related to voluntary skeletal movement. So the whole idea of you being able to voluntarily move your arms or legs, it's going to come through here um, from the cerebral cortex to the cerebellum. And this is called the pontine nuclei are going to help here in the pons. Um, this is also going to have an area called the pontine respiratory group. This area is going to contain a pneumotaxic area and also an apneustic area. Now pneumotaxic area is going to actually help you so it's going to help you with breathing quicker. This is actually turned off when you're in your normal breathing in and out state. However, if you're going to go run to your car or something like that and you need your breathing to increase, this area is going to come into play and increase your breathing. On the other hand, if you look at the apneustic, this may sound familiar because it's apnea. Apnea is the stoppage of breathing. Um, this area should come into play whenever, if you if you do stop breathing, it's going to make you start breathing again. Okay. Um, so the whole point of this area is to prevent termination of breathing, to prevent that stopping. And so we see that if you're in a deep sleep or something like that and you almost quit breathing, this area should come on and say, hey, breathe. Okay, obviously in babies and things like that, when we talk about SIDS, this is probably the area in the brain that's not working properly, and that's why you have that uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, people who have sleep apnea, they have to normally wear the mask, and that mask, when it detects that you're not breathing, it puffs the air, which makes you breathe. Okay, um, also if you try to hold your breath for too long, um, eventually it causes you to pass out so that this area can allow you to start breathing again. Okay, so that's what this apneustic area within the pons does. So it helps with breathing, but it's not just your normal breathing. This is when there's something wrong with the breathing. It's going to keep it, you from having the termination or stoppage of breathing. Now with the pons, you also see that there are going to be four pairs of cranial nerves that come off here, starting with number five. Um, with number five, this is the trigeminal nerve. This is going to help with chewing and sensations for your head and your face. Um, number six, which is the abducens nerve, it's going to help with the movement of your eye. Um, your eyeball and specifically. Um, you'll also see cranial nerve seven, which is your facial nerve. This is gonna help you with taste, salivation, your facial expressions, and also lacrimation, which is the formation of tears. And then cranial nerve eight, the vestibular cochlear, um, you're gonna have a branch of it coming off here. So one branch of number eight is gonna come off of the medulla, the other branch is gonna come off the pons. All right, now moving up, we have the midbrain. This is the last portion of the brainstem that we're gonna that we need to talk about. This connects the pons to the diencephalon. This area is going to have a lot of autonomic functions, meaning they're automatic functions that are subconscious that you are not aware of them taking place. 
Um, we're also going to see that the cerebral aqueduct passes through the midbrain. This connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. Um, we also see that the anterior of the midbrain, the front part, has these little areas that we call the little feet. These are called the cerebral peduncles, and you can see them here in the picture. They look like little kind of extensions or feet. These contain axons from a number of areas. The first is the corticospinal. We also have the corticobubular and the corticopontine. They're going to conduct nerve impulses um, from motor areas of the cerebral cortex, which is the top part of the brain, to either the spinal cord, that's the corticospinal, goes to the spinal cord, the corticobubular goes to the medulla, and the corticopontine goes to the pons. Okay, so guys, corticospinal, spinal is in there, so it tells you it's talking to the spinal cord corticopontine, the pons is in the name, so it tells you it's talking to the pons. So the only one left over is the corticobubular, and that's the one talking to the medulla. Okay, so that's going to have these three tra main tracks in here that are going to talk to the different parts of the lower part of the brain. We also see that in the midbrain, there's the, going to be an area on the posterior backside that's called the tectum. This is going to actually regulate your auditory and visual reflexes. Um, so this is going to be where you move your head due to a stimulus, and it's normally a reflex. So a lot of times if you're just sitting there and you hear a buzzing near your ear, Okay, you don't even normally think about like, is it a bee or, I mean, you're not, you're not going to be like, oh my gosh, is it a fly or a bee and think about it. No, you just automatically move your head and start swatting with your hand. That's a reflex. Also, if you've ever been in a 3D movie, you know you're in a 3D movie, but if something comes out of the screen at you, sometimes you'll move your head out of the way. It's a reflex. We do the same thing when something comes flying at like the windshield of your car. Okay, you move out of the way, but the windshield is there to help protect you. Okay, but it's a reflex that happens due to either auditory stimuli, the sound, or visual with something coming at you. Now, this area is controlled by four rounded elevations. Um, they're called the superior colliculi. This is the reflex center for the eye, head, and neck movements in response to the visual side, so the superiors for the visual. Um, the inferior colliculi is the reflex for the head, trunk, and movements in response to an auditory stim stimulus like a buzzing of an insect. The midbrain is also known as the subthalamus um, because it's below the thalamus um, that we're going to talk about. And the diencephalon. This area has what we call the substantia nigra. This is going to be an area that releases dopamine. The whole point of this area when it releases dopamine is to help control your subconscious muscle activities. Um, this area a lot of times is damaged in somebody who has Parkinson's. If you see somebody with Parkinson's and they shake a lot, that there, your muscles are constantly being triggered to move, but normally this area is going to suppress those movements so that you're not shaking. However, somebody with Parkinson's is it's not doing that job anymore, and so you see that they have the shakes that are present. In this area as well, you're going to see that there's the red nuclei. The red nuclei contains synapses, um, which help control muscular movements as well. Um, there's nuclei for two pairs of cranial nerves that come through here, cranial nerve three, which is the oculomotor nerve. This is going to help you move your eye as well as your eyelid, like when you blink. It also is going to help control the pupil and lens um, within your eye to help focus so that you can see. And then it also is going to have cranial nerve four, which is the trochlear nerves. This again is for going to help you with eye movement. Now, another thing that's located within the midbrain is called the reticular formation. This is a network arrangement of neural cell bodies in small bundles um, with myelinated axons known as the reticular formation. This is the inner tissue of the brain. It is not only found here in the midbrain. It runs actually through the medulla pons, midbrain, spinal cord, and diencephalon. However, in this picture, you can really see where it's located. Um, the reticular formation actually has both sensory and motor functions. Um, it's going to help regulate your muscle tone. It's going to alert the cerebral cortex that sensory signals are coming in. And so this area is called the reticular activating system or the RAS. Um, this is really important because when you're sleeping, if you hear your alarm or you know your eye with your eyes are still closed, but you can know that the light is on or the or lights coming in through your window when it's in the morning, um, those are areas that are going to activate the cerebral cortex and cause you to start waking up. Um, this area also helps you maintain your consciousness so that you can stay awake. Um, sometimes it doesn't work so good, especially when you're in like a lecture or something like that. And we've all done it before. We're sitting there and you're like falling asleep. Your RAS is not helping keep you awake, your reticular formation. 
Um, inactivation of the RAS produces sleep. This is a state of partial consciousness from which an individual can be aroused. So this isn't going to be that super deep sleep or a coma where you can't arouse somebody and wake them up. However, when this area does become more inactive, it does cause you to get sleepy and go to sleep. Damage to this RAS area, on the other hand, can result in a coma. And this is a state of unconsciousness which, in which somebody cannot be aroused or woken up from. All right, so now we've talked about the brain stem. Let's move on into the cerebellum. Now with the cerebellum, the cerebellum is also known as the little brain. You can see here that it's the second largest portion and it does mimic the largest portion, which is the cerebrum. Okay, it um, is separated from the cerebrum by a transverse fissure. Remember transverse means across. Fissure is going to be an indent in which that Fox uh, cerebellus we had to, we talked about earlier is located. So it's going to keep the cerebrum up here at the top and the cerebellum underneath it. Okay, that's the kind of almost as like a tent that this uh, cerebellum sits in. The, cerebell the cerebellum central um, area is constricted or pulled together and this area is called the vermis guys vermis means worm and so you can kind of see how here it looks kind of like a worm because of this it creates a right side and a left side which are called the lateral wings or lobes of the cerebral hemispheres the cerebellum is really important in your control of your subconscious skeletal movements like your muscle tone, your posture, and your balance. Um, mostly this is controlled by the anterior and posterior lobes of the cerebellum. Um, they're going to receive information that's sensory impulses from your proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are found in your muscles and different things and they are aware of where your body is at any given time. Okay, and while you're sitting there it knows where your arms are, it knows where your legs are. When you're sleeping it knows where all those things are as well. Um, it also is going to get information from your visual receptors. All right, because your eyes help you keep your balance as well. Have you ever tried to stand on one foot with your eyes closed? If you're going to do that, you take this visual part out of it and you're relying only on your proprioceptors communicating with your cere uh, cerebellum. Okay, and so that's going to help them the, with the balance. Again, it is involved in equilibrium or balance. This is mostly going to be what we call the... Uh, the flocculonodular lobe, which is the underside or bottom side of the cerebellum. All right, so this is just giving you an idea of the fact that this area is mostly going to help you with your muscle tone, your posture, your balance, but also receiving information from your body of where everything is at any given time. All right, so our next the next area we want to talk about is the diencephalon. This is located nearing the midline of the brain, the inner, middlemost part of the brain. It's just above the midbrain. This is composed of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So if we look here in the picture, you're going to see the epithalamus is towards the back, shown here in red. You have the thalamus, which is shown here in orange, and then in pink you have the hypothalamus. So these are going to be the three main areas of the diencephalon. Now the diencephalon is surrounded by the third ventricle, which is that opening that's going to produce cerebral spinal fluid. The diencephalon also acts as a relay station. Um, one way I like to look at it as a relay station is if you think back in the old days when you, when you saw those operators where like everybody on the block used the same kind of phone number and that sort of thing and that lady would say, well, where, where do you want to be connected to? And they would actually move and they would connect the different areas, different lines physically. Um, we don't have to do that anymore, but technically that's what they were doing. So that's what they were doing is connecting. That's what the thalamus is going to do. It's going to relay the information to the proper place it needs to go to in the brain. Um, also, this is, would be what you would kind of think of if you've seen the Disney movie Inside Out. Um, that movie where the headquarters is located would be kind of like here in the diencephalon, where then once information comes in and it's processed, it's sent into the area it needs to go. Okay, this area is going to help regulate your body rhythms, like with your sleep and wake cycles, but also your emotions and it's going to help secrete hormones to help maintain homeostasis. So let's talk about the thalamus first. The thalamus is going to contain nuclei which serve as those relay stations. This relay station is going to be for all of your sensory inputs. Okay, um, All of them with what we're talking about with sight, hearing, um, taste, touch, uh, pain, all those different things that come in that give you sensory impulses except smell. Smell is also going to be processed here in the diencephalon, but it's going to be processed more by the hypothalamus, not the thalamus. Um, peripheral sensations are processed here in the thalamus in conjunction with their uh, 
attendant memories or emotions they evoke. So there's times when you see something and it causes a reminder or an emotion to come up of a memory. Um, a lot of times this is where that connection is going to be made. If you see something, hear something, smell something, that sort of thing that connects to a memory, this is where it's going to take place. The thalamus also registers your con conscious re uh, recognition of pain. Okay, so when something is uh, harmful, hurting you, um, temperature, whether it's hot or cold on your skin or your body, um, light, touch, so that tickle of that hair that you just can't locate that's in your shirt or something like that, that that's what we're talking about there with light touch, but also pressure. Okay, so this is going to be relaying that information to the different parts of your brain. Now the hypothalamus on the other hand is located below the thalamus. This actually forms the floor of the third ventricle, that opening that's going to create cerebral spinal fluid. The hypothalamus has a lot of jobs. Um, it does function. It does function as a relay station for your smell reflexes, so being able to smell. But its main goal is to help you with regulating homeostasis. Well, how does it do this? Well, the hypothalamus is going to be constantly regulating your heart rate, your blood pressure, your respiration, and your digestion. And it's going to use also the, the medulla to help with this because if you'll recall, the medulla has those vital centers for respiration and um, the heart. Um, it also does subconscious control of your skeletal muscles, especially like facial expressions. This is why sometimes you can't hide when you are mad because it's a subconscious thing. Okay, you may think that you're hiding it pretty well, but since somebody's gonna be like, what's wrong with you? And you're like, nothing's wrong with me. And they're like, no, your face is telling me something different. This is especially important when we're talking about that because it's a subconscious um, uh, control of your muscles of your face, especially. We also see thermoregulation for your sweating, shivering, or shunting blood to different areas depending on if you're hot or cold. Um, thirst mechanism is here, so whether you're thirsty or not, it's going to use special receptors that are called osmolarity receptors. Uh, feeding, glucose receptors, knowing if you're hungry, that sort of thing, causing your stomach to growl. Um, different hormone secretions, which will be discussed in chapter 18. Uh, circadian rhythms, this is with the penile gland, releasing that melatonin that puts you to, uh, makes you sleepy or tired, as well as connecting with the reticular formation we just talked about. Um, also located here in the hypothalamus are what we call mammillary bodies. The mammillary bodies are going to interpret order, odors. They're going to be important with licking and swallowing. Um, one thing to note though, we'll talk about this too in the sensory chapter when we talk about special senses, is that taste and smell are closely linked together. Well, this shows you why, okay? Because when we look at this, these mammillary bodies are going to help you interpret or odors. They also are part of with licking, which is with your tongue and, and the t your taste buds are on your tongue as well as swallowing. Okay, so there's that connection between taste and smell here. The last area that's part of the diencephalon is the epithalamus. The epithalamus is, a, is superior and posterior to the thalamus, so it's a little bit above it and to the back. Um, this is where the penile gland is located. The penile gland secretes melatonin, which is involved in your diurnal cycles. Melatonin is secretly, secreted mostly at night and causes sleepiness. In some animals, remember, um, melatonin is related to seasonal breeding patterns, not in humans, but it is in some animals. We also see that in this epithalamus is going to be what we call the, we also see the habinular nuclei. This is going to be your emotional response to odors. Um, it's involved in olfaction, your sense of smell. And so when we look at this, this is why sometimes you'll smell something and it'll bring up a type of emotion. Um, it, smell is actually one of the biggest things that's linked to um, memories and emotions, um, even more so than sight, sound, and that sort of thing. That's why sometimes you might smell something and it causes a buildup of emotion, especially maybe after a death of a family member or something like that, and that's because of this area of the brain. Also, we're going to see that it contains the coracoid plexus from the third ventricle, which is there to create the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, so if we take a look here at the brain structure, this is kind of like what you'll see when you do your dissection. They're not color-coded like we see in your book, okay? It's all kind of more of all the same kind of color, but in this picture, you can see the coracoid plexus are located here. You can see the thalamus is labeled, uh, the penile gland, the hypothalamus. You can also see the mammillary bodies, which is located on the underside of the hypothalamus. So this is just to give you a closer up view. And so this slide might be helpful when you do your brain dissection so that you can take a look at those structures.
All right, so now this brings us to the largest portion of the brain, the cerebrum. Um, this is also known as the cerebral cortex. This is your seat of intelligence. Um, the outer rim of the cerebral cortex, the outer part is made of gray matter, which is the cell bodies and the dendrites. The inner part of this is gonna be the cerebral white matter, which remember white matter contains the myelinated axons um, that are part of the nervous system. If we look at the cerebrum, there is going to be a split at a longitudinal fissure. This is also going to be what we could see with the cerebral cortex. The white matter remains connected inside this fissure. Okay, it's going to have a right and left side. It's going to come longitudinally. This fissure in here, though, is going to be connected by what we call the corpus callosum. This is going to allow the right side of your brain to talk to your left side of your brain, and so there is going to be communication between the two because of this. So if we look at it and you kind of make a heart-shaped, we have the the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, but where they come in contact to make that little heart part right here, this is what we would call the corpus callosum. They're connected and they are communicating with each other. Now, with the cerebrum, you're going to notice that it's going to have, um, it's going to be highly folded. So when we look at these folds, they're called um, what we call gyri. Um, the deepest of which of these folds a lot of times are called fissures, okay, because they're a lot deeper. If they're more shallow, Okay, if the folds aren't as deep and they're more shallow, then they are termed sulci. All right, so when we look at this, the bump part, okay, like the mountain part, the bump is called the gyri. As we move down, it's either called a fissure. The valley part's either called a fissure if it's deep, or if it's shallow, it's called a sulci. And a lot of times, guys, the fissures are going to um, be between major portions of the brain. Like we see here where you have that prominent longitudinal fissure, which separates the right side of the brain from the left side. So you have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. Um, the central sulcus further divides it, uh, your brain into an anterior or frontal lobe, which is going to be here in the front, and also then parietal lobes, which are going to be on the sides over here, which are shown in the blue. Now, there's a couple of these um, bumps and dips that are going to be important when we look at their location here on the cerebrum. All right, so we're gonna take a look at these. The first one's called the precentral gyrus or gyrus. This is anterior to the central sulcus. That means it's in front. Um, this area is actually gonna be on the frontal lobe and it's the primary motor area of your cerebral cortex. So where most of your motor information is gonna come from with moving your arms, your legs, that sort of thing, your fingers, your toes, is gonna come from this area. Just behind that central sulcus is called the post central gyrus or gyrus. This area is going to be your somatosensory area. This is going to be where all your sensations come in for touch, um, pressure, pain from the majority of your body. Now it's important that these two are in close contact to each other. They're just separated by that sulcus because let's just say that you touch something hot with your hand like a burner or curling iron. We don't want to leave it there. We obviously want to pull that away so that we don't continue to burn ourselves. Well, the sensation is going to be detected by the postcentral gyrus or gyrus, which is the somatosensory area, but the movement of the hand has to happen in the precentral, where it's going to be the main part of the motor area, right? But they're in close contact because of that. We also see that there's what we call the parieto occipital sulcus. This is going to separate your parietal lobes, which are here on the side with your occipital lobe which is in the back. You also have the lateral cerebral sulcus or fissure. This is going to separate the frontal lobe from your two temporal lobes, which are here on the side. The temporal lobes are here. We also see that there's an area called the insula, and this one actually, if you'll notice in the picture, is the yellow. It's underneath the temporal and frontal lobe. You actually have to pull a piece of that out. It cannot be seen when we just look at the surface of the brain. It lies within the lateral cerebral sulcus deep to the parietal, frontal, and temporal lobes. Okay, so it's going to be deeper inside of the tissue. All right, so when we take a look at this, guys, the lobes of the brain are actually going to be named corresponding to the bones that cover them with the brain case, and you've already learned these bones, so this should be pretty easy as we go through here. So if we look here at the blue, the blue, we know that this is the frontal bone, which means that part of the brain is also known as the front frontal part of the brain. We also see that here in the kind of reddish color, we see the parietal bone. The parietal bone is going to cover the parietal part of the brain, which is the sides. We also see here that it have a purple region that's the temporal bone. On the bones, we see down here in this kind of grayish, it's almost the same color blue as the frontal, but you see the temporals here. These are your temples. This is where the temporal um, lobes are going to be right underneath here. And then over here in the kind of orangish 
um, yellow color, you have the occipital, and the same thing on the brain back here as the occipital lobe. So this should be very easy to remember because you should have already learned these bones for the brain case back in anatomy one. So when we look at the cerebrum, the cerebral white matter consists primarily of myelinated axons that are three types of tracks. They form either they form one of these three types of pathways. The first the first pathway is called the association track. These contain axons that conduct nerve impulses between gyra and the same hemisphere. So this is gonna be when the right side of my brain is communicating with through itself and the left side's communicating with itself. All right, where maybe we have a message that's being sent from the occipital lobe to the frontal lobe, okay? Um, but it's on the same side of the brain. Okay, these are association tracks. On the other hand, we have what we call commissural tracks. These are gonna conduct impulses between corresponding gyri from one hemisphere to the other. This is gonna use that corpus callosum we talked about, okay? What we know, know as the anterior commissure, po posterior commissure, where they're gonna cross over. So this is where my right side of my brain is going to communicate with my left side of the brain. The crossing over is gonna take place. The last type of track or pathway is known as the projection tracks, and these are gonna convey impulses to a lower part of my central nervous system. So it's gonna talk to the thalamus, the brain stem, or even the spinal cord, or information is gonna come up from those areas to this upper part of the brain. They're projection tracks where they're projecting the information to a further place place, okay, where they're going to go to a different area of the brain or central nervous system itself, like the spinal cord. Now, also located in the cerebrum, we're going to see that there's going to be some nuclei that are present. Remember, nuclei are going to be the, the cell bodies. Um, one region here is called the basal nuclei. This is major area of cell bodies deep in the cortex, which are going to help you initiate or terminate movements. So starting a movement and also stopping the movement is going to be controlled here. This area also suppresses any unwanted movements. Again, it doesn't work 100% of the time. Again, it doesn't work 100% of the time. This happens sometimes like when you get the chills or something like that, it doesn't suppress an unwanted movement, but it also helps regulate your muscle tone. This controls subconscious contractions of skeletal muscles, so the basal nuclei is also going to be very important with working with your um, cerebellum, okay? Um, so the cerebrum, the basal nuclei of the cerebrum are going to be in contact with the cerebellum to help with controlling posture, unwanted movements, things like that. Now, one thing to note about it, initiating and terminating movements, guys, this is a lot of times um, an unconscious thing as well. So like when you go to walk across the room, that automatic movement and swinging of your arms is gonna be caused by this area that's gonna help with that. Um, also, true laughter as a reflex to like a really funny joke where you're actually really laughing at something, not just that pretend like kind of, haha, that was funny, but a real laugh. This area is going to help with that um, and, and, and regulate those skeletal muscles as you're laughing because it does cause a lot of movement with, with your body. Now the next area we want to talk about is called the limbic system. The limbic system is actually located um, throughout your brain. It's not in a specific area and you can see it's located, you can see it here in this green structure where it kind of flows through almost all areas of the brain. Um, it's an aggregation of nuclei contained in the cerebral hemispheres but also the diencephalon like the thalamus, hypothalamus. Um, this functional system is involved in your emotions, your memory, your pleasure and pain centers. Um, also, you may have heard of the amygdala. That's the area where rage and aggression comes from. Um, together with all the different parts of your cerebrum, the limbic system is going to help function with memories. And this is why a lot of times you can remember things better if you can tie it to an emotion or tie it to something that you already know. Um, if we can relate it to something that we've already made as a memory, it's going to be easier to pull it back out. Okay, um, and the limbic system helps with that. All right, now guys, in the cerebral cortex, there's a lot of areas that we call functional areas of the brain. Um, this is called Brodmann's areas of the brain. Um, he actually developed this and published his findings back in 1909. So this is actually a very um, research from very long ago, and we've actually found he's pretty correct on this. Um, one way that this information was kind of um, acquired was not is not ethical it's not an ethical way to to treat patients or things like that now but back when patients were put in like a sane asylums and they were considered insane they would do those different um 
lobectomies and things like that where they would take out different lobes of the brain or they would um, do electric shock and on certain parts of the brain and we'd, they, they would see what would happen. What did they lose the ability to do? And because of this, they were actually able to map out on the brain where things were located. Again, I'm not saying it was an ethical way to do it, but it is very helpful today for us in the sense of knowing where in our brain certain areas are located that do certain things. We do know in our brain that there are certain areas that are called sensory areas. These areas are there just to detect sensations and let us know what's going on around us. There's also motor areas. These motor areas are going to actually cause your body to execute voluntary movements like moving your hand when you touch something hot or when you stubbed your toe, the reaction that you have where you grab your foot and jump around and you may say some choice words or you sit there and do this kind of breathing like it really helps with your toe being stubbed. When we look at that, that's kind of the reaction here with the motor side. We also see the association areas. These are going to deal with more complex integrative functions such as memory, your personality traits, and your intelligence. Okay, these are the association tracks. Now, in your textbook, you have these uh, Brodmann's areas that are numbered and they show you where they're kind of located. Now, the picture is actually found on page 497 in your book, but there is some um, explanation of each of these numbers found on page 498 and 499 in your book. So you'll notice that there's different areas that are labeled. Um, the primary somatosensory area, which we've already talked about, is located here in the blue. Um, the primary motor area is here in the pink with that number four. Um, the primary auditory area is number 42, which kind of makes sense because it's part of the temporal lobe area, which is by your ears. Um, you'll also see that number 44 is the Broca speech area. That's also located near where you're going to detect sound. This is why a lot a lot of times when kids learn how to talk, it's through mimicking what they hear. Okay, so that's why um, kids that can't hear real, really well, they may have like a speech impediment or not be able to talk at all because there's an association between these two, okay, that are there. Um, number 17 is the primary visual area. That's where you're going to have your vision. Um, and what's weird, if you'll notice, that's on the occipital lobe. That's at the back. Your eyes are at the front. So what you take in here is going to be actually um, determined and um, interpreted back here at the back of your brain. So this is just showing you where these, these different areas are located. You're not going to have to memorize this, um, where their location is, but it is important to understand what the auditory area means. That's for hearing. What does the visual area mean? That's for sight. You do need to know those sort of things. So if we look at this, guys, I want to take a look first at the primary somatosensory area. We're going to come back to this when we get to the um, chapter where we look at the integrative properties of sensations. But if we look at the primary somatosensory area, you're going to see that the parietal lobe is the big part of this. It contains the sensory areas for touch, proprioception, pain, temperature. Um, there's also going to be a visual, auditory, taste, smell area as well in this area, in, in this part of the brain. The occipital lobe is going to contain your primary vision area. The temporal lobe is going to contain things for hearing and smell, but they're all going to be communicating. One thing with the primary somatosensory area though, guys, is this is a distorted somatic sensory map of the body. This is known as a sensory homunculus. Guys, homunculus means little man. And if you notice here in the picture, it's distorted because if we look at this as the picture, is your hand really that big compared to the rest of your body? No. Are your lips really that big compared to the rest of your body? No. But what they're showing you here is that when we talk about touch, okay, pain, things like that, your hand has more receptors for that, okay, that's why it's larger compared to your toes. Okay. Now you may not think that if you have, if you're a parent, you've stepped on a Lego before or like a Barbie shoe or something like that. Okay. But there are less receptors there than there are in your hand. This is why individuals who are blind, what do they use to read with? They can detect the little changes in those dots and stuff with their fingertips, not with their toes. Okay. And so we'll see that those areas are larger. Your lips are very sensitive to touch compared to other parts of your face. Okay, so that's why you'll see that it's a distorted view. This allows us a lot of times to pinpoint exactly where we're feeling a sensation. Okay, where you're like, oh, I have pain right here on my on my thigh, or I have pain right here on my shoulder. Um, I feel something touching me right here on my back. You can feel that stuff in, in, in de and detect it because of this primary somatosensory area. 
Now, if we look at the cerebrum, we do have some primary areas for different special senses. And guys, the one with the little degree sign means primary. So the primary visual area, guys, is located on the occipital lobe, mainly on the medial surface, okay, towards the middle. The primary gustatory area, that's for taste, is found um, next to the somatosensory area. Um, the primary auditory area is the superior part of the temporal lobe, so the top part of the temporal lobe. And the primary olfactory area, which is smell, is going to be the inferior medial part of the temporal lobe, so more towards the middle of your brain near the temporal area. Okay, so here on this picture, I try to show you this as well, where you have the motor area, the primary sensory area, but you can also see taste, hearing, smell. Um, this one also shows you like speech, body awareness, language reading, vision. You'll notice that they're connected to certain areas that are important for them to be coordinated. Okay, you can't read without seeing it if you'll notice it's near the vision part. Okay, and also language is very close to the reading as well as the hearing. Okay, and so this is really important when we see that they all are kind of coming together um, to help you be able to accomplish different tasks. Now, the primary motor area, this is showing you the motor homunculus. Um, it's the little man, it's still distorted if you look at it, um, but it does look a little bit different. Um, but the whole point of this is that um, it's looking at what part of the brain is devoted to those specific muscles to help you be able to do very complex or skilled movements. And you're thinking, well, then why is the hand so big? The muscles in here are so small when we looked at it back in, um, in Anatomy 1. But the thing is, you do fine motor with your fingers. You being able to write or tie your shoe or do little things with your fingers and do small movements. The whole point of that is to allow for that delicate, skilled movement. Whereas other regions of your body, when you look at like your quadriceps, with your leg, those are all big muscles that all can only do one thing, okay? They can only help you with flexion of the knee in the most for the most part. And so there's not going to be as much of a skilled or complex movement there as you would see more with your hands, your mouth, with talking, things like that. Okay, um, one area that I do want to talk about real quick is the Broca's speech area. Um, this is normally localized on the left frontal lobe. It's more on the left side of the brain in the frontal area. Um, it coordinates contractions for your speech and your breathing muscles to regulate the proper flow of air past your vocal cords to allow you to speak. It's one thing to make noises and sounds, but to actually put them into words, this area is going to help you be able to do that by coordinating the muscles with your breathing as well as your tongue and allowing you to be able to produce certain sounds. All right, so the last thing I want to talk to you about here in part one, um, in part two we'll talk about the different right and left side of your brain and your cranial nerves, is the association areas. These areas are going to allow you to associate um, with the different um, sensations and movements that we um, do. So you have the somatosensory area, we already talked about this. This allows you um, to determine like the exact shape and texture of an object. So this would be like if you were feeling it without seeing it, you could feel what kind of shape it has, its texture, um, they use this a lot of times if you've seen on Facebook or even um, back when the show Fear Factor was on and they'd have to like place their hand in a box and they can't see what it is but they have can feel it. Just the idea of not being able to see it sometimes would freak them out but it might just be a stuffed animal or cotton balls or something like that. Other times it might have been a snake or something different but it allows you to feel the object based on its texture and shape and kind of determine what you're um, dealing with. Okay, um, it also allows you to have the sense of relationship of one body part to another and memory and recall of past sensations that you've had before. Like, oh, that feels like the same pain I had before or you understand what hot feels like or cold feels like after the first time that you've registered it. Um, the visual association areas, this allows you to um, relate past and uh, present visual experiences, um, being able to evaluate if you've seen it before or not. Um, again, this is the visual area. Another area that's kind of important with visual is facial recognition. There's actually an area in your brain that stores information about faces. This allows you to recognize people by their faces and this is more of the right side of the brain that helps with this. So if you're really bad at faces with names and things like that, this area of the brain may not be communicating as well as it should. Um, we also have, see the um, auditory area. This allows you to recognize a, a particular sound as speech, music, or just noise. And this is a perception. Some people who think something is music, uh, the same uh, no, that same music can be heard by somebody else and they think it's noise. It's going to be what they perceive and what they feel based on that um, sound that they're hearing. 
We also see the orbital frontal cortex. This allows you to identify odors and to uh, discriminate among different order, odors. This is also found on the right side. So being able to detect the different senses that are, are the different scents that are located in something. If you've ever been around somebody and they smell something and they're like, oh, that smells like lavender and, and they just like keep expanding on it and you're like, uh, it just smells good. Um, some people have a keener sense here with this um, orbital frontal cortex with that idea of being able to distinguish the different odors from each other. The next area is called the Wernic Wernicke's area. This interprets the meaning of speech by recognizing spoken words. This is more on the left side of the brain. This contributes to your verbal communication and it also allows you to add emotional content to it. This is why like sometimes if you get really excited about something or something good has happened and you're trying to tell somebody about it, that excitement comes up, that passion, it causes you to have emotion behind your words. Whereas other times there may be sadness, happiness, anger, that kind of thing where Nikki's helps you with that. Um, also, when we look at this too, if somebody's had a stroke in this area, they may have a hard time recognizing those spoken words, okay, because this would be the area that might be affected. We also see the common integrative area. This integrates sensory interpretations and allows the formation of thoughts based on a variety of sensory inputs. This is going to be an area where your what you see, smell, taste, hear, touch, all of that can be put together and integrate into a memory, into a type of structure. The prefrontal cortex is concerned with the makeup of a person's personality, um, their intellect, their common learning abilities, um, their ability to recall information, um, whether the person has initiative, do they take action or do they kind of stay back and they're more of a follower, their judgment their foresight, their reasoning patterns, like why they do what they do, their conscience, okay, when we talk about that little idea of conscience of being able to know what, do you feel guilty about this or something like that, um, your intuition, a lot of times I talk about women having this where they have this intuition of what's going on, your moods, um, planning for future, um, developing abstract type thoughts like loneliness or something like that, this area is going to help with that. So if somebody has damage to their prefrontal lobe or their frontal lobe, it can affect a lot of things. Their personality could change. Their decision making could change. They could become more impulsive okay, and not think about things as much. There's a lot of things that could be hurt here if the frontal lobe is, is damaged. We also have the premotor area. This can cause specific groups of muscles to contract and specific sequences. A lot of times memory helps with this. It's kind of like that whole idea. They're like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just like riding a bike. Once you've learned to ride a bike, you can always ride it. It may be a little rusty and your balance may be off at first, but then you can get to going and doing it again. This is where that whole idea of muscle memory comes into play. And then you also have your frontal eye filled area. This is going to control the voluntary scanning movements of your eyes. Okay, so like when you scan a room and you look around, being able to take in information, this area is going to help with that. All right, and so this talks about a lot of those association type areas. Um, I hope this kind of helps you with the beginning parts of chapter 14. We will continue in part two talking about the lateralization, the two sides of the brain. We'll also talk about brain waves and how we measure them and the cranial nerves in part two of this lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me.